what is seal determination? It is to determine or to find out uh, the amount of risk uh, in a process or in a unit that we're looking at or in a specific scenario or several scenarios that have the same consequence and severity uh, will require to reduce the probability of that harf harmful event from happening. So then we will determine whether we need a safety instrument function or not. If we need a safety instrument function, so if we see the requirement of a safety instrument function, then the level of performance of that safety needs to be determined. So what would be the level of performance in the previous exercise? It was a sealed one. That's a level of performance required for that safety instrument function. And we will find out how Safer Profiler allows us to engineer um, such a safety instrument function. So Safeguard Profiler is a software tool that allows to determine the amount of risk reduction required to lower the risk, whether it is a risk graph methodology or whether it is a layer protection analysis methodology. Because we're, we're talking uh, about safety integrity levels, well what, what does that mean? So safety integrity level is related to a probability of failure on demand. So when equipment it is demanded to work, so how reliable it is. Is it going to work or is it going to fail upon demand? Uh, so that's when we talk about seals. So seals are ranges. So if we have, uh, have this next uh, slide here on which I showed the ranges. For example, if a, a seal one range that we found out before on this uh, risk graph methodology that we ended up needing a seal one, what, what does that mean? So that means that I need to reduce risk by a certain amount of uh, uh, risk reduction, right? Uh, so my equipment has to be of certain performance level. So that's uh, what it means. So if I, if I need a SIL2, well, the probability of failure on demand will be between 10 to the minus 2 and 10 to the minus 3, including 10 to the minus 3, and so on, and a SIL3 and a SIL4. Usually we don't see uh, higher than SIL4, that's uh, really too much risk. And we shouldn't see SIL4s either. SIL4s are very complicated and they don't show up or, or they're not needed that often in industry at least. They might, you might see some SIL4s in uh, military applications or in other places in nuclear industry maybe. Or some plasma gun that might be someplace else. I worked in once in one of those ones, so and they're rare, so usually you should not have uh, seal fours. But seal threes, yes, you might heard about um, high integrity pressure protection systems. Those are HIPS. You might ha heard already about BMSs or uh, boiler management systems or burner management systems, and, and in those cases. There are some risks that are there of explosion and so on that require equipment to, uh, as a safeguard to catch that um, scenario mechanism going into a bad place, going and to cause an explosion. So if we can do something to stop that from happening, the equipment, well, first of all, you find out that that doesn't happen that very often. But if it happens, then we should have something very reliable that is, uh, we are sure that it's going to respond. Okay, so that's why the high reliability needed, or the uh, high, or the very low probability of failure when required to work. So now we start looking at uh, there is a relationship between reliability and probability of failure on demand, and they have to do with probabilities, right? Uh, probabilities of success or probabilities of failure. Probabilities of successes will with respect to uh, being very reliable and probabilities of, of failure would be having a, maybe a, a, a certain probability of failure on demand. So that's what it means. So the IC61511 offers these tables and these tables are also inside Safeguard Profiler. Safeguard Profiler uses this table to discriminate and give you an indication how much risk uh, it is there. Just in the same way that uh, the risk graph was telling you how much risk was there uh, so Safeguard Profiler also uses the same approach and if there is a gap it will tell you you have a gap equivalent to a SIL1 gap, right? It is interesting to make reference to that scale. For people that uh, is used to work in the, the SIL verification, that, that's very nice. Uh, so we have here the relationship in these tables with the between 
probability of failure on demand or safety availability on other ways how available is that system certain point of view would you say that that is reliability that's for sure so we have probability of failure so the safety availability or reliability of that system would be one minus the probability of failures probabilities are numbers that are between zero and one okay so if I have a probability of failure of 0.5 then that means what would be the probability of uh, success would be 1 minus 0.5 would be 0.5 and if you multiply by 100 it gives you a percentage right so and on the other side instead of having small numbers we can relate to decimal numbers going from in ranges of uh, numbers that we are used to here every day so 1 2 3 10 100 a thousand so if we take the reciprocal of the PFD number of the probability of failure and demand that gives us these numbers so they are easy for a lay person to understand what that means so probability of failure on demand of 0 0.1 would be equated to a risk reduction factor of 10 probability of failure on demand of 0 0.01 would be equivalent to say a risk reduction factor of 100 and so on so now we're going to talk about safety integrity levels why because that's the measure that we decided that we're going to use according to IC 61511 so therefore that's the measure that sa uh, safeguard profiler uses also in order to give you what is the gap or how good that the safety implemented function has to be so there will be assigned a su level that uh, safety implemented function so we have here a graph and this graph is uh, one side is representing the probabilities of failure that goes from uh, small all the way to increasing uh, all the way to one so downwards goes decreasing upwards goes increasing so uh, the, if the probability of failure on demand increases the seal level decreases so the better it is the seal level the higher it is for a SIL3, a certain point of view with respect to a probability of failure is better than a SIL2, and, and it is shown in there. So how do we explain these probabilities of failure on demand in time? So we, s we know that everything has to fail eventually, right? So how often uh, things fail? Well, it depends on each um, characteristic of all those equipment. So as soon as you put your pieces of equipment to work, they are start getting stresses and those stresses uh, stress the, the equipment and eventually if you don't do anything to them they will fail and the big thing is that we don't want them to fail when required to work so there are many things that influence or the, that we assume um, by using the standards the IC61511 standards and we assume that we are using equipment that is reliable and that equipment that is fit for purpose and it is the equipment uh, proven in use just in the same way as Safeguard Profiler is. We start plotting this in a graph and finding out uh, what would be the average probability of failure on demand uh, of that piece of equipment. So we can see here there is a curve. So the moment that starts the equipment starts, we assume that uh, his probability of failure is zero or that his reliability is 100%. And as time goes by, the probability starts to uh, probability of failure starts to increase. Until if we don't touch that equipment, eventually, in time, it's gonna fail, right? So here we have hours in this x axis. This is the time axis, and, and 8,760 hours is one year. So we have two years, three years, and here we are assuming that we're testing that safety instrumented function every year so every year the safety instrumented is tested and because we say that the failure rate of that those pieces of, of equipment we consider them to be constant during this useful life and let's say that the useful life of this equipment here is 10 years that's what is shown in there um, so we decided to proof test that equipment every year so every year we set the reset the clock back and we say if it is was working at this time having worked and at time before so then we assume 
that is still in this constant failure rate that means it is not going to fail and uh, so I assume that is a, a good equipment and I set the clock again uh, as it was uh, new some people don't consider that um, that that is new there is always some piece of uh, um, stress that stays there and that will never be able to get rid of it and um, we have some uh, way to deal with that but the theory for now is that we have a perfect proof testing 100 percent proof testing and most of the time that's the way that the equipment behaves as long as you're doing your maintenance as long as you're following exactly the vendor's uh, instructions on when do you have to refurbish your equipment how do you have to do maintenance to your equipment it's just like your car when you buy your car you have to change the oils you have to check the transmission according to a specific schedule so y if you follow correctly those uh, maintenance um, procedures for your equipment so your car will have uh, the useful life that was uh, predicted if you don't do your duty then you cannot say that your car has a constant failure rate or that will give you that uh, reliability during all those years exactly the same thing happens here with the equipment in order to be able for us to say that we can reset the clock back to zero is because we're maintaining that equipment that is called functional safety management so that we're doing our management functions we're maintaining our equipment we're proof testing our equipment and making sure it's in a tip-top condition in that way we can make that assumption that if, if it is was working at this time it still is going to be working until at uh, the end of useful, useful life from other cases well you have to we'll, I'll show you how what we do in those other cases for, for this case case from that it is taking into account in IC 61511 this is how, how, how it shows so I will take uh, what is called the probability of failure on demand average so it's an average probability of um, that equipment uh, failing when it's needed to work so you get all those proofs testing during a year and that would be what it gives me my probability of failure on demand and wherever if, uh, that probability of failure on demand fails in or into uh, uh, the ranges that I showed you before for seal 1, seal 2, seal 3 so that would be the probability of failure on demand so as time goes by you can see there that uh, probability increases but I can stop that at specific uh, places I can stop that and uh, reset the clock by testing my equipment and making sure that it was working and most of the time when would you how often would you test your equipment well you will test your equipment as often or more often than the expected demand rate of your uh, safeguard so how do you find out what is the expected demand rate well that is fine you find out during the layer protection and analysis sessions it you will calculate there how often do you expect to have um, this um, causes uh, initiated events happening developing into uh, an unwanted event um, that initiated mechanism that takes you all the way there so all those numbers we can calculate from the layer protection analysis and those numbers are going to be the specifications for starting to be the specifications of our safe instrument function so that's uh, very good to, to realize at this moment that that is happening so here's a showing again if we don't do anything to our equipment so our probability of failure on demand that was shown before because because I was doing proof testing it was showing a high seal 3 now if I don't touch that then my probability of failure on demand went again higher right. these graphs are uh, kind of examples so don't don't take them as such <laughs> this is just showing you what what's um, possible how, how does it work what is the functionality uh, or how does it relate the probability of failure and demand relates to a seal level and it is clear in that way so I was talking about before um, what happens if I don't consider 100% uh, proof testing that means that uh, every time I test my equipment somehow that equipment uh, it is uh, stressed and the damage done to that equipment is not rec recoverable so as time goes by there's a the deterioration of that equipment it is increased in such a way that it will affect uh, in a big uh, way 
the probability of failure that it has, right? So at the end of 15 years, I might say, well, the probability of failure is going to increase. And what we see here is that every time I do a proof testing at this moment, for example, every year, I have to leave out, I cannot start back from zero. I have to leave that uh, stress that was left in there so just a little bit. And that stress is cumulative, right? So the next time I do it, so I have to put whatever it was there before plus a little bit more and so on. So, and at the end of that, those 10 years or nine years, 15 years of the unit working that, that he already uh, was uh, at its um, useful life, I have to change that equipment, but I can see that the probability of failure on demand at that time, at the end of those 15 years, 10 years, it is higher. So what some practitioners do is that they calculate that at this point and then they already put into the equation and that is certain point of view very, very conservative. So because you are working f half of the life of that system and you're already incrementing that probability of failure demand all the way up. So this number, I would suggest that to calculate that, um, not giving total credit for 100% testing, just to do it incrementally, not just doing it all at once and thinking, that, okay, in 15 years, this is when, what it's gonna be. There are some tests that were, has been done today and there's a percentage that you might say, well, what is the percentage uh, at the end of the useful life of the equipment with respect to what it was at the beginning? So you might see that sometimes it is 5%, sometimes 2%. Extreme cases will be 10%. So when you start your uh, calculation and you find out what is the probability of failure on demand in a per year basis, doing a proof testing on a per year basis, then you will have to add 10% more of that value to the total uh, from the point of view of the useful life. So you already starting to work with your probability of failure on demand very high. Is it that um, logical? Uh, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Uh, you, I think that you should put more emphasis in taking good care of your equipment instead of counting that you're going to leave it there uh, without any maintenance or doing anything to it and then adding that probability of failure on demand. The software profiler will allow you to do either way. Which way do you want to do it? That's okay. We can do it both ways.